Welcome, Welcome everyone. Good evening. Ah, so good to be here with you. My name is Stacy. I'm uh, one of the teachers at Common Ground Meditation Center and so glad that you chose to be here with us this evening to hold vigil for truth and justice. When we planned this, envisioned this some weeks back now in response to the trial that was about to take place for the officer involved in the death of George Floyd, we of course had no idea that already again, there would be another police involved killing of an unarmed black man. And so this coming together seems all the more poignant now that we turn toward one another, our community, in the face of injustice and grave and violence so that we are not turned away from ourselves or turned away from our practice. That we are reminded of the capacity of this heart to care, do good, and offer compassion in these hardest of moments. And so it's really been a, uh, uh, just a real blessing to gather with teachers that uh, I met a number of years ago, or just a couple of years ago now, um, at one of the largest gatherings of Black African descended Buddhist Dharma teachers in the United States. And our teacher this evening, Nolawe Alexander, was one of the organizers for that gathering of more than 70 Black African descended Buddhist teachers. Noli Wei hails from the West Coast, holding it down in Oakland and has dedicated her life to offering the Dharma to historically marginalized folks, queer, BIPOC, and has been co as co-founder of organizations Peace at Any Pace, whose mission is to offer healing to people of the African diaspora who suffer from the impact of intergenerational and ancestral trauma. So it is with great pleasure, gratitude, that I welcome Noli Wei to our blessed Sangha here this evening her wisdom, and we may have the opportunity for small groups later. So what I will ask is um, if the BIPOC folks who are here this evening are interested in being in a small group with other BIPOC folks, that you raise your um, virtual hand. Um, and I think that's in, under reactions if you have the newer version and uh, of Zoom and the older version, I believe it's under, if you go to participants. Gabe, uh, our beloved assistant this evening, will be working to put BIPOC into small groups. So if you see your virtual hand go down, that is because Gabe has is working behind the scenes to get you into the group. So once you've raised your hand, um, we'll take good care of you and you ha don't have to do anything more. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nelly Way. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for the invitation, Stacy. Um, you know, it's interesting, again, I feel so honored to be here with you uh, today. Again, I'm, I'm no leeway, sometimes you'll hear, hear no Lee. And I just wanna tell you just one other thing about myself. I am the daughter of Larry and Marge. And I'm the granddaughter of Maggie and Sydney, and they both came from Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm also the granddaughter of Laverne and Elizabeth. I'm a wife, 
and I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother of a four-year-old sweetness, uh, Calvin, and a step-grandma to Jeremiah, who's nine. And I'm here with you because the path has been laid open for me by my ancestors. It has been laid clear for me. And I never begin anything without giving them honor and respect. I'm here because as the African saying, I am because we are. So I stand on the shoulders of many. Um, so again, it's an honor to be here with you. I think you're pretty much familiar with the trajectory of the evening. We're going to have um, a, a practice period or a sit for about 30 minutes. Um, we'll have a little bit of a, a small interlude, a break where we can take a bio break or stretch break. I'm gonna give a, a Dharma talk. Um, and I have to be real honest with you. I'm not quite sure what it's gonna be, <laughs> you know? Uh, I, um, and I'll talk a little bit about my process for this evening. Hmm. And then if we do have time, which I hope we do, we'll go into some breakout groups and there'll just be a guiding question and then we'll, we'll close and I promise to get you out of here at 7.30, your time, 5.30 my time. And as Stacy said, I'm on the West Coast, I'm in East Oakland, I'm holding it down over here as I am holding my heart with you all in Minnesota. So, why don't we just begin by just taking a breath to land? Let's arrive here. Many of you may have come from work or school or dinner <laughs> or with your families. So let's just arrive first. And I have to tell you, it's so beautiful to see you all on my screen. It's just, you know, I have a big screen so I can get 50 of you on one sheet. <laughs> so it's just beautiful. It's great to see you. All your faces, your presence. So as we begin to arrive, just feel into this body if it is comfortable for you. You can begin with just closing your eyes. And I must say, if that is not accessible to you, you may leave them open or lowered right in front of you, maybe down, if you're sitting, maybe down on your where your lap would be, or your hands may be placed. But finding just a pause right now. And as you begin to arrive and ground yourself into your seat, just knowing that your body is sitting. It could be sitting in a chair or on a cushion. You could be standing or lying down. These postures are what is brings you most ease. And as we begin to kind of settle into this body, these seats, taking a bit of an inventory of how your posture is, your position right now. Beginning at the top of your head and finding ease in your neck your spine, bringing your shoulders down and away from your ears, resting. The 
Seeing if there's any tension that may be in your jaw, between your eyes. Just gently making whatever corrections you need to, to bring yourself to ease. As you begin to continue into feeling into your body, feel into your lower spine, your buttocks firmly on a seat or standing. How are your arms resting? Bringing some ease to that position. And now your, your thighs and your calves, ankles and feet firmly on the, resting on the ground, feeling the energy of the mother rising up to meet you, supporting you. She's helping you ground, coming home to that natural order of the earth. And if it's accessible to you, finding your breath. The constant, ever-changing breath. the inhalation, the exhalation, this life force. You may need to find another anchor to return to. It might be sound. Perhaps a bird outside your window or a hum right around your environment right now. It may be having your hand on your chest to feel your heartbeat. Just those places of coming back, returning to this present moment. And as you find the rhythm of your own breath, begin to notice the sensations of the air coming into your lungs, into your body cavity, and then expelling out and again, the inhalation and exhalation. Staying present. And not to adrift in thought or planning or, or remembering just right here now.
And taking a moment to recognize this gift that you're giving yourself in this time. The gift of collecting the mind, joining it with the heart. deepening into a place of refuge, the body, the breath. This gift of this present moment in this moment. in this moment. If your thoughts begin to arise and just begin to come back to your anchor, that place of home base returning to the breath, to sound, the heartbeat returning, continuously returning. Staying connected to the body, leaving nothing out.
feeling back into the body, just seeing if there's any tension that can be released. Maybe it's in your neck, shoulders, spine, knees, legs, just making some slight adjustments to bring yourself back into alignment. Just slowly making some moves for ease. Bringing more air into the body cavity. Finding places to rest. Connect to the earth, to your breath, to your heart.
in these last few moments of this practice period, I offer you a poem, Patachara's 30 Nuns. Farmers take grain from the earth and branches from the trees. They crack them, they crack open one with the other and take what's left to feed their families. You are all unripe grain, take time to grow. Then leave the ground behind and let your husks be stripped away. I promise, less is more. So Patachara told us. So we sat on the ground like unripe grain. We gave ourselves to the path and the path broke us apart. What we feared most is now seen for what it is. True peace, freedom. All that broke apart was the darkness we had so long been calling our whole world. Thank you for your practice. I felt the depth of your, of your beings these last few minutes. So thank you. So we're gonna take about a five minute stretch break and we'll come back for a, a short Dharma talk. And uh, so I'll see you back in about five minutes. Welcome back, Sangha. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, it's such a pleasure to, to be here with you. And I have to tell you, it is, it really, it's, it was, it's this, <laughs> this particular talk, this particular evening has worked me all day. It worked me since yesterday. This visual, I think, was such a well, beautifully designed place for us to hold what we're going through right now. What you're going through, especially in your communities, but we're all going through this globally. And then the events of Sunday happened that Stacy spoke about when we first came on. And... Um, yeah, I went to bed last night and I tossed and turned and I woke up about midnight. I got up out of bed, I wasn't even asleep. I got up out of bed and I said, I've got to sit and I need to write a little bit because my mind was swirling and my heart was actually very full. So that's kind of been my process today. And I just wanted to share that with you with, with absolute transparency. And my talk this evening is called, Where Does It Hurt? Suffering in the Time of Injustice. And I have to tell you that, um, I'll give you just a short story, then I'm gonna read you a poem where this came from. A sister friend of mine, Dharma friend, sent me a podcast of an interview with a woman named Ruby Sales. Some of you may be familiar. She's a racial and social justice leader in Atlanta. She's a founder of an organization called The Spirit House, The Spirit Project. And this podcast was um, with Krista Tippett on On Being, which happens to be, I think, in the Minnesota area. And um, Ruby Sales is a forerunner in the civil rights and, and social rights justice um, movements. 
And her podcast was called, Where Does It Hurt? And I actually, as soon as I heard it, I said, I know I've heard that somewhere before. It was truly an amazing story, but I knew I had heard the title somewhere. So I searched and searched until I found the poem where I had first heard it. And I'm gonna share with you this poem now. The poem is called, What They Did Yesterday Afternoon by Warshan Shire, W-A-R-S-H-A-N Shire, S-H-I-R-E. She's a British writer, poet, editor, teacher, born in Somali, Kenya. And this is her poem. They set my aunt's house on fire. I cried like women on TV do, folding in the middle like a five pound note. I called the boy who used to love me, tried to okay my voice and said, hello. He said, wash on, what's wrong? What happened? I've been praying and these are what my prayers look like. I come from two countries. One is thirsty and the other is on fire. Both need water. Later that night, I held an atlas in my lap. I ran my fingers across the whole world and whispered, where does it hurt? It answered, everywhere, everywhere. And so I had heard this poem and I started to really live into that, that whole piece of where does it hurt, given the, the conditions and where we are at today. And as I was starting to prepare for this talk, I realized this was such an excruciating experience for me to try to bring together what my heart mind was feeling. And it was difficult on a lot of different levels. Some, I don't know if I've actually really identified yet. And although I was trying to navigate what this was going to be for me, I was envisioning what this moment, how I was going to actually bring together something connective and something coherent for you all something thoughtful and hopefully something impactful to share. And I also realized that I had to li live into what was emerging. I couldn't be set, have a, a fixed mind as to what I was gonna say because I actually, I'm really letting spirit guide me in this one, Sangha, really. So in sharing the poem, what they did yesterday afternoon, what struck me really was, and what I gravitated to was the last three stanzas. And as I was reading it, I felt the air in my body just <sighs> expel. And it kind of felt like a little bit of grief, I mean, relief actually. But then with deeper reflection, I actually realized what it was, was grief. And if you don't mind, I'm going to say these three stanzas again. I've been praying, and these are what my prayers look like. Dear God, I come from two countries. One is thirsty. The other one is on fire. Both need water. Later that night, I held the atlas in my lap, ran my fingers across the whole world, and whispered, where does it hurt? It answered everywhere, everywhere. And after I went back to the poem, it just, I just had this feeling of being totally undone. Because what I was really living in was the grief that I'm feeling in my heart. And it's the grief of so many things that we're all feeling right now. This grief is unanswered and some of it is unspoken. Last March, I was um, teaching on a team of a month long retreat at Spirit Rock, a 30 day month long. 
and we were 14 days into the period. And we realized that we had to tell everyone in the retreat who had already deepened that they needed to leave and go home because shelter in place was happening. And I could see on the faces of the yogis grief, not knowing this uncertainty of what was going to happen. This grief that is unspoken and sometimes unanswered is the pandemic and the overt killing of our black and brown and Asian and trans bodies. It's the grieving of death of family members in France. And I have been exploring what is this indescribable grief that has an intersection between suffering and pain. But what I know for certain, and this is what I wanna share with you, I can tell you with certainty where it hurts for me. It may resonate with you and it may not. But for me, it hurts my heart, my soul, my faith. It hurts my hope, my pride, my mind, my arms, my ability to connect. It hurts where my ancestors lie. It hurts to see bodies murdered, mass incarceration, injustice everywhere. It hurts to see police systems set up to destroy, not to protect. It hurts to see the unawakened and those who just don't care about our human conditions. It hurts to see children in cages and separated from their families. It hurts to have to call out those names over and over again, it hurts to be sheltered in place while many don't have shelter at all. It hurts to see Mother Earth still weeping and struggling to maintain. It hurts to know that I may not see racial and social justice in my life. That's where it hurts for me. It hurts everywhere. And this grief, this suffering, it just gets masqueraded and disguised in so many other places. It's, it's fear, it's anger, it's depression, it's loss, it's pain. It's what we're experiencing now, just watching television. It's sorrow. It is impacting our psyche and our minds and our hearts. And I went about reading some suttas. I was really trying to find out what did the Buddha say about grief? And what I found was that grief wasn't necessarily spoken to, but it was sandwiched between pain and suffering. And in this book, beautiful book, Awake, Wings of Awakening by Tanesra Bhikkhu, he says this, one of the most important insights leading up to the Buddha's awakening was his realization that the act of comprehending pain lay in the essence of the spiritual quest in trying to comprehend pain, instead of simply trying to get rid of it in line with one's habitual tendencies, one learns many valuable lessons. And indeed we do just think about those lines that I just read. The effort it takes to investigate where we are sitting in our pain, in our grief. And this is what goes on underneath the surface. It's those, almost indescribable sensations that we have. And we can talk about all the Buddhist teachings around suffering, but what we are doing today, and I can just say in this moment, the trial, last Sunday's shooting, murder, 
the things that are happening in prisons around the country, the things that are happening everywhere in our globe. This is beyond this greed, hatred, and delusion, these three evils that the Buddha talked about, which is the causes of suffering. This in itself is soul suffering. At least that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling that right now, as I'm talking to you, this reverberation in my heart. Soul suffering. And it's suffering for George Floyd and Dante Wright and all of the women in Atlanta, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Ab Abner Luima, Eric Gardner, Stefan Clark, Army Lieutenant Karen Nazaro, and countless others that are unseen. This is soul grieving. And I have to tell you, the visual part of seeing this terror has buckled me to my knees. And I'll take a quote from Fannie Lou Hamer. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. This is where my soul is weeping, you see. And this isn't a pretty talk, y'all. But this is the talk that we need to have. And I think we have to bear witness to what's happening in our hearts and in our minds and in our conditions, <clears throat> excuse me, with some real truth. We can't mask it away. We can't, we have, there is a place in which some people have the opportunity to exit stage left, right? Ignore it, turn off the TV. It's not there, it's not me. But for people of culture like myself, I have no other alternative but to live in it. And there is this place in which we want to get to this other shore, right? The other shore, as Shante Diva says, the other shore of freedom and ease and liberation and non suffering. We want to get there. We want to get in a boat that actually has both oars in it but not one or, or the or is broken, or the system is broken. We want to get to the other shore of freedom. As the poem I just read from the nuns, what we feared most is now seen for what it is, true peace and freedom. All that broke apart was the darkness we had for so long been calling our whole world. This cycle of suffering, this cycle of grief and loss. This is what some of it, some people say it what brings us fortitude, right? We have to have the, the 10,000 sorrows and the 10,000 joys and the Tao is saying oftentimes it's simultaneous. And yes, that is an experience. But it strikes me that the Buddhist teachings are at their trickiest in regard to grief because everything changes. We're taught that time and time again, impermanence. All that is born dies. It's right there in the foundation of the philosophy and the cosmology of the Four Noble Truths, the causes of suffering, and the cessation of it. But grief then is clinging to this, this place that sometimes we just can't get away from. And what is more natural than to grieve losses? of people, conditions, even our own society. If grief is just another manifestation of ignorance, that it will go away, then 
do we lose the practice of humanity? I hope not. Because it feels to me as though there's a fabric here that as we are touching into this place of grief and suffering and pain, we're actually finding something in ourselves that is our human condition, this humanity, this place that we can touch into. So how do I practice with this grief? How do we develop the tender capacity to hold grief and still be open to its presence? I'll share with you another poem that I think is incredibly beautiful. It was spoken at the same event that Stacy Stacy spoke to. It was in 2019. It was a Black Buddhist gathering at Spirit Rock. And a teacher, senior Buddhist teacher, Larry Ward, he has an organization called the Lotus Institute. He was a student of Thich Nhat Hanh. And also he worked with nonviolence and social justice. He read this poem and it touched me so. When I became currency, when they came for me, I tried to contain my fear and my heartbreak. My bones long for home as I, sick in the bottom of a ship, became dark currency over the sea. I was sold again and again, a commodity, an instrument of profit, sustained by greed, arrogance, ignorance. Cold and beleaguered in a new land, unknown, I tried to figure, I tried to forget such horror, but the look and whispers and sufferings even to this day remind me. I am a class of color created by a colonial mind missing its own self-worth. But the dance of my ancestors in my bones have kept me awake, kept me alive. I live beyond such limiting constructs of mind. I am free because I'm not confused. I am stardust awake. I am the earth and sky embracing all. I ride the wind with the eagle and the hawk. I flow with the rivers into all oceans. I touch the sun. I am touched by the moonlight like all beings. I stand in the house of belonging. I walk the beautiful way of my ancestors. I dwell in the field of beauty within me, beauty behind me, beauty ahead of me, beauty all around me. I am nature herself, awake, powerful, resilient, generative. I offer my love to all my ancestors and to all of yours. Like rain falling on the wise and the unwise, the troubled and the untroubled, the just and the unjust, so that the wounds of time may be healed in the internal dance of the flows of birth and death. I am currency no more. How do we live into this place? Unearthing our true nature and still standing with our back straight. Standing for what is just. and asking ourselves the very simple question, where does it hurt? So we can go to those places of grief and pain and suffering and then open up. We are innately good. And yet we don't see that it being exhibited in our world today. We need wise discernment to veer away from those patterns of the narratives that keep creeping into our, our views and our perceptions. I don't wanna be unconscious any longer. 
I haven't been for years, but there are those who are. You see, I have a four year old grandson who will be walking into the streets of this world very soon all by himself. What do I tell him? Straighten up your back, don't run. This is where it hurts for me. And so what I have been working with, practicing with, is changing all of the narratives that are coming at me, allowing a different way of healing this grief. And Sangha, I'm not there. I'll be the first one to tell you, I am not there. Because even now I'm tripped. I keep going back to the Buddha Dharma as my refuge and my family. Lama Rod Owen says in his book, Love and Rage, look at how the narrative keeps us from actually doing the really important work of liberation in our own experience. It's not supposed to feel good. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be really uncomfortable. If it were easy and fun, everyone would be doing it. And I wish everyone was doing it, trying to get to that place, the other shore, the other end of the shore. Dr. Joy DeGru in her book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome says, if you don't write your own narrative, somebody else will write them for us we have an opportunity to begin to shift and change. But we have to get off of our good intentions as well. And it's just not, I'll sit on the cushion and practice. It's more than that. It's really asking yourself, where does it hurt? And if it hurts enough, what do I do about it? I'm not asking or even suggesting that the pain of our grief is not felt or that it should be hidden or go away. It's much too big for that. But I'm inviting us to see where we can transform from living in this traumatic and exhausted body so that we can reach the other shore. This is soul work. This is the coming together of the body, mind, heart to bring about the resilience that is needed to stand in this wretched fire of injustice. This is work not meant for just one. Yes, as I mentioned, yeah, we look at these places of non-separation within ourselves between pain, suffering, grief. But this healing and fortitude comes in community. I am trying, and I'm not there, to allow myself, and it may not be today, a pathway into this healing process. Finding refuge in the Buddha Dharma, in family, in community, and in knowing wisdom and truth and love. It's a gateway for me to go forth. Audre Lorde said, without community, there is no liberation. There are 115 people on this call this evening. You already have the container set. It really is the time to let go, surrender into this community.
and not get to the place where you have to say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. What we're seeing today is not new. I have enough history now in my lifetime that I can see it's not new. Many of you do. I can see it in your faces. But like I said, what we're doing here today and what we're going to be doing by actually starting to unearth this grief and pain and suffering is really for future generations. I may not see this in my lifetime. I feel it now, but I may not see the relief today, but I am so hopeful that I'll see it for my son and for his son and for his son. This is what we're doing this. This is why we're on this path for this freedom, for this liberation that we feel. Where does it hurt? It whispered back everywhere, everywhere. And I'm not, I'm almost 100% certain that you're feeling it as well. Let's awaken our heart, mind, body to this moment in community. This is soul work. This is soul work. A lot of times I, I give a talk and I've got a joke here and a joke there, but I just can't, I can't pull it up at me. Not today. And Sangha, I so appreciate you and your kind attention and the ways in which you can feel into this for yourselves, the reverberation the vibration of this interconnectedness that's happening within you. Thank you for letting me hold vigil with you. I appreciate your kind attention. Thank you. So Gabe, we do have some time to do some breakouts. And actually, it's a very simple question. Where does it hurt? Where does it hurt you? Easy question. Easy question to say, harder question to touch. So we're going to do some breakouts, as we said, there's going to be a group with, with um, BIPOC folks, and then we're going to randomly put people in other groups. And then we'll be back for closing, and I promise to get you out of here at 730. So thank you again, family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you had some time to first reflect and then share amongst each other, amongst yourselves. Um, as promised, we have a few more minutes. I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy. Thank you all for coming, joining our community tonight and coming back from your small groups. I hope that was a rich and nourishing sharing that happens there. I wanted to offer um, the opportunity for you to support Common Ground Meditation Center and Noli Way. 
um, as you may know, Common Ground operates um, on Dana, which is the Pali word for generosity. So there's no charge, no fee for any of the programs. Noli Way raised her hand, said yes to come without hesitation, without reservation, without promise of anything at all. Um, and it's the sweet generosity of folks just like you that offer what they can to support the center, to support the livelihood of teachers. So you can visit the Common Ground website and um, identify or name Noli Way uh, as the teacher for this date and she will receive two thirds of the offering. Common Ground will retain a third for operations as we still have staff and are able to continue programming in this virtual way. Um, next week, also one of the organizers of that Black Buddhist gathering will be uh, joining in community with us, Miyoke Kane Barrett, who is uh, one of the first, not one of, the first woman and Westerner to hold position of bishop in the Nishran Order of North America. So uh, I hope you're able to join us again next week. So what we have is probably less than a minute. So as promised, um, let's just kind of settle ourselves down. Back into our seats or in our position, our posture. With your eyes closed or gently lowered whatever is more accessible to you. And I'm gonna end with a saying from a beautiful scholar and poet and teacher and writer, and then we'll dedicate the merit. And this is from Audre Lorde. Black and third world people are expected to educate white people as to our humanity. Women are expected to educate men. Lesbian and gay men are expected to educate the heterosexual world. The oppressors maintain their position and evade their responsibility for their own actions. There is a constant drain of energy which might be better used in redefining ourselves and devising realistic scenarios for altering the present and constructing the future. And this is from her series of essays and speeches, Sister Outsider. As we take these words and the merit of our practice this evening, we gently take a breath into all that we have heard and all that we have felt. And as we sit in this awakened state, not fully awakened, but opening to the possibility of awakening, we dedicate the merit of our practice to all beings, two-legged, four-legged, winged and gilled, all of those who are suffering without exception, above or below, beside us and all around, and to our mother, this earth that carries us. May all beings find the path to freedom and liberation. Thank you, Sangha. <laughs>